Thoughts you get a chance to see Joe yesterday in some of the breakout sessions. Well, just a quick uh, bio for those that didn't. Uh, Joe's says almost everything he's learned in his 38 years farming in the Northern Prairie was born out of necessity. It is really the mother of invention, he says. Joe had his first aha conservation moment in the late 70s. He tried it on a few fields in 79. The next year he went all the way, growing every field of corn, soybeans, and cereal grains with no-till. He said it made our neighbors wonder what we were, in the world we were thinking. They didn't wonder for long, though, as the 80s turned into be a dry, and no-till proved worth its uh, weight in both uh, conserving soil and water. In the 90s, the problem flipped from too dry to too wet, so Joe started trying cover crops, many types uh, with field peas, brassicas being the ones that impressed him the most. In the last 10 years, Joe has adopted an advanced cover crop system that alternates strips of brassicas and field peas on 30-inch centers. Using GPS guidance, the corn is planted directly over the brassica strips. It's like strip tillage without the tillage, or bio-strip tillage, I guess, as it can be called. Please join me in welcoming Joe to the stage. Am I on? I am. Good morning and thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful morning in Ontario, isn't it? It's always a beautiful morning in Canada, though. So yesterday, with Woody's kickoff with the conference and uh, no U.S. national anthem, I would have taken a knee during the Canadian one if I'd have known that. <laughs> that's, that's gotten to be kind of stupid. But anyway, you got to laugh about things like that, don't you? Um, <clears throat> so I apologize right up front. I got good news and bad news. For those of you this is the bad news. For those of you that have seen my presentation yesterday, it's going to be basically the same. The good news is, is I can't remember what I said yesterday, so it might be different. All right. Um, on the other thing about my title today, that after 30 years of experimenting with covers, I've got it aced, I just have more questions. And I'm serious about that. After 30 years of, of messing around with different covers, uh, trying to improve a no-till system, um, I, I just have more questions. I, I, I'm, I'm here, I came here basically on Woody's invite to this conference, but I really came here to talk to a group of farmers that I haven't talked to before uh, for an opportunity to learn uh, what I can do to improve my system. And, and I know there's some takeaways already that, that I, can, I can do that with. So a little journey, this is fairly current. Um, we've been able to partner with grower groups. In here we've got North Dakota Soybean represented, North Dakota Corn, and North Dakota Extension Service. So <clears throat> to me that's the way, those are the people you want to surround yourself with if you, if you want to bring information to your farm and get information back off to other producers, is, is there's groups like that. If you can get them digging around in your fields and going, having that, maybe having that aha moment, uh, it's, it's beautiful. So, a little bit about the past. Uh, this was me in 1980, planting with a conventional John Deere press drill and uh, actually had quite a bit of success with it. Our, our, yield, our direct planted yields that year on Durham were 40 bushel, and the same exact sunflower fields that we chisel plowed, put anhydrous on with a chisel plow in the spring and field cultivated them, planted them to Durham, ran 20 bushel. So it was an eye opener. And not only that, but the ones we chisel plowed were full of wild oats and volunteer sunflowers. And uh, the, the ones that we direct seeded had minimal. So this is my dad, and I got to give him a lot of credit for my, uh, what would you say, inspiration to reduce tillage and to try to look after the soil. He was a product of the 1930s. 
He was uh, in 33 when it started to get really dry on the prairie. Uh, and then 34, 35, and 36, the horrible erosion that went on uh, through that period. He was 13, 14 years old. So very, at a very impressionable age. And uh, he, he always shared with me that there has got to be a better way to farm to try to save, save that from happening again. He saw fields literally destroyed uh, by, the, by the, those three years of horrible wind erosion. Now, with that said, we still have a lot of erosion. Okay, uh, here was a transitional piece of machinery I used in the early 80s. Uh, it was made out in the Pacific Northwest. I actually go out, got to go out and seed on those 50 degree slopes. And this is a picture of me on a 50 degree slope um, doing some no-till seeding with that yielder drill. That was an experience. <clears throat> in 1984, I was a no-till leader in our community. I didn't know squat, but I was the no-till leader. My son sitting on our lap, that's my wife Patty, my son sitting on my lap is, is now 36 years old and has nine kids. Uh, some of those things you run across, my brother has been involved in machinery business. His, his, his whole career I farmed, he's been involved working with machinery and manufacturing. Um, he saw this one day, this was in the mid-80s, and he said, uh, do you think this could work on the front of that drill to remove some of that residue in front of the op disc openers? And I go, I don't know, let's try it. So we put a set on and it worked pretty well. So that was, that was the precursor to the residue managers that you see planters. Uh, spent a decade or so using shank drills. This is a Concord air seeder out of Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, they were not originally designed to do no-till. So we spent the best part of a decade uh, getting them up to speed on, as, a, as a direct seeding drill. The good news about them is they had good seed placement and they had the capability of placing fertilizer in, in, in a one pass, getting a full program done. So they were fairly success, successful, but I wanted to move, we had to do a fair amount of, in the industry, I guess it's called residue sizing. You know, you had to do something to control the amount and length of residue, uh, or they would not go through a shank type seeder. And uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of shank cedars still used on the, on the Great Plains. Uh, in the late uh, 1980s, like 88, 89, I was wanting to have something that would do a little bit of residue removal and help me warm the soil up. Uh, so. We played around with some things on the farm, and then DMI, a manufacturer out of Illinois, uh, came to, to myself and my brother and said, we'll give you a toolbar, a side dress toolbar, if you make it into a, you know, inline fertilizer applicator. And uh, nobody really knew what it was called yet, but it became strip till. So, uh, it was something that we worked with early on, and we're, uh, I guess, a fellow by the name of Jim Kinsella in Illinois, and I were probably some of the first ones strip tilling. This is an early, early strip till. You can see that was before GPS, so didn't, had to drive the tractor then. Uh, magazines started picking up interest in things like earthworms, you know, things you could see. Uh, the, the degrees in microbiology, as far as to pertain to agriculture, were, were not even being issued yet, right? Nobody was going to school with a degree in microbiology in agriculture. So it was really primarily what you could see with your naked eye. You could see the same things you see now. You see uh, uh, soil structure improving and uh, some of the macro insects and critters like earthworms. Something else we discovered in that journey is that our, as our biology got better, they got better at eating our residue. So this was a year after a wheat harvest, 
And we had a program in the 90s called, uh, we had an acreage reduction program in, the, in our USDA farm programs. And we had to leave these fields fallow and not produce on them. Well, after a, a summer of not having anything on it, the, the biology in the soil, earthworms and all other funguses and things like that, just totally destroyed the residue. So there was, I could raise good corn, but we didn't have a lot of residue left. So then that's when some of the early cover crop things came in, is how can we cover these fields and still not produce something on it? Well, here was a flax cover crop and then plant the winter cereal. Okay, present day. We've all in North Dakota learned how to cover our fields and we don't have any erosion anymore. Right. I saw a little thing on the TV this morning. Some place in Siberia. Uh, some of you, anybody see that in here about the black snow in Siberia? I, I thought they were driving around North Dakota. Oh, a nice summer rainstorm coming through, right? No, it was just dirt coming in on a front. That was just two years ago, right in my backyard. Okay, so what are some of the planting things green. I'm currently doing to, to try ride. to planting enhance the system? Green. Planting green, everybody in this room has probably heard that concept. It's, it's really and getting to be uh, popular. We'll get it in the next few days. I have about an 18 to 20 inch annual rainfall or annual precip uh, profile. So we do have to watch how much moisture we let a growing crop ahead of an intended harvestable crop. We, we have to watch how much moisture that crop takes or we might not get our crop up in a timely manner. So here I'm in a sprayer. I had decided in this particular case that I, wasn't, I couldn't dare let that rye get any bigger than early boot stage. Not that I didn't want it to, but we were starting to get dried out in that top four to six inches. Uh, in this particular case, it worked great. You know, beans coming in that dying rye. Harvest time, you know, had some of the best beans I'd had up to that point. A Couple other ways we're trying to get covers into our system. Uh, applying rye, uh, aerial applied in, in corn at about uh, about the time it senesces. So for us, that's about mid-September. And uh, with rain, with adequate, adequate moisture, and if your insects aren't too bad on the top soil surface, we, crickets eat a lot of seed on us. I heard a gentleman yesterday talk about uh, the night crawlers will come up and sweep everything into their hole and suck it down, you know, including the seed that you broadcast. So, Broadcasting seed is broadcasting seed. You're, you're at the whims of Mother Nature, whether it's going to work or not. There's a typical <clears throat> cornfield that I'm planting soybeans into with a flowing on rye cover crop. It's not real thick. It hasn't used a lot of moisture either. So sometimes I can let this stuff grow some more and actually control it after the beans are up. We're trying a system, and it was talked about yesterday, interseeding. This is a piece of equipment, again, a collaboration made by the Amity Drill Manufacturing Company in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, made for North Dakota State University, and then used on farms, and moved around and used on different farms. So again, a great collaboration uh, on uh, trying different systems. This, this drill has the ability the, kind of the nice part about it is that you can not only seed your covers, but it has a banding opener on it and a split tank, so you can side dress at the same time. And that, so that's a concept we're, we're experimenting with, is to be able to side dress and plant your covers at the same time. <clears throat> the one thing we're noticing is the covers get out-competed. Uh, of the four years I've done it, one year I didn't really have anything left for covers that survived the spring. Now we're, we're, we're planting a multi-species cover in there, but primarily we want, the only one that would survive would be rye, and that's what I'm hoping makes it through the winter. 
Uh, and this year, this is this year, in a 250 bushel corn crop, and it survived. I mean, this is right behind the combine. In fact, the combine's in the picture. Uh, so this year, the interplant looks like it worked. Uh, my, my first and primary cover crop sequence is after cereals. And I, you can see in this picture, I'm in the field seeding covers before I'm done combining. So literally, we're harvesting and seeding covers on the same day. So a lot of, a lot of local farmers, that's one reason why they don't like cover crops, because who's got the manpower the labor resources, and maybe even the equipment resources, to be seeding while you're combining. Well, you know what, what I tell them is most of those guys have a disc ripper in the same field at, at harvest time. So why can't you pull a, you know, why can't you pull an air seeder uh, or some type of... So if you can do tillage at the same time you harvest, you can, you can do covers. Uh, <clears throat> again, this drill, this Amity drill, it's actually of Australian design. A farmer that I've gotten to be very good friends with designed this for his farm in Australia. Uh, we added a fertilizer banding opener. So there's three openers per pair row. There's a fertilizer opener and two seed openers. So what I can do when I'm planting covers is I can seed, for example, uh, a faba bean or a pea or a large seed, I can put that in the banding opener and plant it deeper, and then plant the small seeds like brassicas, flax, uh, camelina, whatever you're planting, uh, you can put that in the shallow openers. And that seems to work pretty well. Here's an example of that, and it's coming up. You can see the faba beans coming up in the middle, and the other covers coming up <coughs> along in the paired row. And that's what it looks like uh, about a month later, um, before we've had any frost or anything. So the, on your right is the faba bean, and on your left is the peas. So I've been doing strip trials comparing peas and faba beans. And uh, this is just a shot of the ideal way to use covers. That's put it through a cow, put it through a ruminant, or maybe put it through a pig, as we saw earlier in this conference. So if you put it through an animal, that everything from the saliva, from their mouth, to their excretions out the back, to their hoof actions on the ground, everything is good for the biology about having animals in that system. This is looking out our, we built a lodge on the farm, and you're going to see that a little later in the presentation. Uh, this is looking out our lodge window at cattle grazing cover crops. Isn't that pretty? Only thing green in that particular shot, all the grasses and other fields are dormant. <clears throat> this is how one plus one equals three. If you have cover crops in your system and can graze them, you can get more out of that system than what you would otherwise. It's a great, it's a great way. Here you can see the faba beans are, starting, are freezing, turning dark colored. That's where the corn will go next year. Another shot, this is in spring wheat stubble, so the spring wheat volunteer came up, was part of the cover crop mix. This was a winter cereal, again, the winter cereal stayed in the fall, stayed you know, down below the canopy. It's there. It's ground cover. Uh, but the, the planted covers then were a little higher. But look at the difference between the faba bean and the peas. On your left side is where faba beans had been in the, in the fall. In with the brassicas, the flax, the cereals. On the right side, it was peas, was the legume. There was 10 degrees, the corn planter is sitting on the end of the field. There was 10 degrees difference between the soil temperature 
in that darker faba bean strip than in the pea strip on the right side. And that, that's, that's a big deal for any place where you grow corn. I, I can say that's a big deal where we live, but it's a big deal any place where you live to get the soils warmed up because everybody's planting corn and pushing the planting window, right? Making use of those growing degree days. This is that same field over on the left side where the green pretty much goes from north to south is where that faba bean pass was. I, <clears throat> I had some nitrogen rate strips on here, so that's why some of those lines are in there. But what I, what I want to just, I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. But this has been no-tilled for 40 years. It's been cropped the exact same north and south uh, for 50 to 60 years. But my ancestors, my great-grandparents who homesteaded in our area, one on my mom's side, one on my dad's side. One grandparent had the North 40, one had the South 40. And one was in pasture during the 30s, and one was being farmed. And every year when I harvest that field, and it has the same soil type, it's fairly flat, I mean within a foot of elevation change across the field, uh, I see this on my yield map. So don't Try to convince yourself that a little bit of erosion is not going hurt to hurt yourself, you know. Uh, it, it shows. And I can see this across my farm in many locations. Um, I'm a little bit blessed to have a very large dairy 15 miles away from me. And they're, they're, they're fairly recent, so it's just recently or in the last five, six years that I've been getting manure from them. And uh, <clears throat> at first I started out having it applied raw, and I was starting to see plants that I just didn't recognize. Now, not like new plants, but like biotypes of plants that I didn't recognize on my farm. And we're all pretty aware of what's growing on our farm, right? And I thought, I bet they're coming in with that manure. So I thought, I'm not going to do, I'm just not going to take in... Uh, somebody else's manure uh, unless I can have some kind of biosecurity. So I looked into composting, actually found a composter made in Ontario, Sittler, uh, tunnel composter. It's great. It's very efficient. Uh, works well. And after six weeks, that's what that windrow of manure looks like. And that is awesome because I can get, I can get two, over two semi-loads of fresh manure into a spreader. And that holds about two-thirds of a semi-load. I mean, now, if you put that back in a semi, you'd have about two-thirds of a semi-load. And I can get two of those original ones in there. And it's lighter to boot. <clears throat> so about once every four years through my rotation... I apply compost on my farm, and it helps. So, why are we doing all these nice things to our soil? Probably has something to do with, with what's living in the soil. And again, you know, the obvious thing is that what you can see, soil structure, uh, color of the soil, and the macroinvertebrates. Um, I thought this was an interesting demonstration, and if you've if you've never had something like this done on your farm, uh, I would encourage you. You could buy you can buy this stuff online, liquid latex, and I think it's a special grade uh, with a certain viscosity. So these young soil science technicians just took their hands and moved the residue away from the soil surface on my farm, and then put a ring down and poured this latex in that ring and let it sit for about 10 days. And it slowly seeped down into the, into the macro pores of the soil. So those little strings that's coming off those uh, latex pads they're holding there are either earthworm bur burrows or rotted root channels or some macro pore that's left in the soil. 
So you can, you can only imagine that the water filtration rate on that land would probably be pretty good, wouldn't it? Uh, one of my rotation, in my four-year rotation, one of them is a specialty crop. And over the 40 years I've farmed, I've always had some, a pulse crop, a specialty crop, something other than corn, beans, or wheat. The last 10 years, I've been raising radish for seed uh, on my farm. A uh, friend and I actually named that radish jackhammer. So how many in the room have heard of a jackhammer radish? Quite a few, thanks. And if you've ever used a jackhammer radish, I appreciate the business. Came from my farm, most likely. We do, we do some advertising and have a website, but it's mostly you just get in contact with wholesalers and, and uh, we, we do very little retail, direct sales. We usually sell through wholesale seed suppliers. Um, just a, you know, a shot of what cover crops do. So like if that's, if that's my bio strip, so if I'm gonna plant corn right on top of that, uh, some worry that, you know, cover crops, what are they gonna be like in the springtime? Well, they're all rotted down and I do like to have a certain amount of in-row competition so that you don't end up with that proverbial fence post in the ground. Uh, and I think we've probably all seen that if we've been around brassica cover crops, you can, in the springtime, you can look down and see a, if you had a hole, if you had one size of a baseball bat, you got a hole there. And uh, I, the, if you create some in-row competition, then you, not, not one gets that big. And I, I think that's a good tip. All right, well, I, I want to tell you about an enterprise on our farm that we started about, uh, actually we started about building about eight years ago. We built a lodge. And the primary reason that we wanted to do it was to have the opportunity to have non-farming uh, families, businesses, you know, come to our farm and stay on our farm and be able to have conversations with them about it. Now, we, we built it for business purposes. We want it to make money, and it is, finally. This is my wife, Patty. She, uh, she, she will tell you that it was my dream and her nightmare. <laughs> but she works, she works hard at it. Um, it was a way to get my kids involved in the farming operation uh, and, and my non-farming children. So my daughter on the left is actually farming. Her and her husband are getting started, uh, kind of parallel to my operation. And, uh, but she manages the lodge, Olivia on the left. And my son in the middle, he's the one that's 36 years old and has nine kids, lives in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, four hours from the lodge, does all our social media. He designed a website. He does all our special event planning for the lodge. He does that all, you know, via internet, which is super cool. So it gives me an opportunity to talk to groups on our farm and talk about agriculture. Take that 800 pound gorilla out of the closet and just lay it all out there, you know? Uh, what do you, what do you have, you know, you, you, they're eating a nice steak, and you tell them that out the window, out the lodge window, uh, that was number 17 from last year. <laughs> you know, it's because it's true. It was. So, you know, it, it, uh, it's important to have those conversations, and, and uh, I think people, well, I know people respond to it. We've had great opportunities. Here's... Uh, Here's what would be a typical special event, a lodge event that we have. We have about one a month in our facility, approximately. And we do it so we can advertise a lodge. So we, we, we have a chef come and we have a brewery or a winery or distillery or somebody come and, 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 and all those are, you know, have agricultural components to it, whether we're eating it or drinking it. So we, we have a chance to people to share their entrepreneurism uh, with people that come to the lodge, and they love it. We, 
We usually, my daughter's very good at trying to pair up, you know, if, if four couples come and three of them, three of the couples are from Fargo and one couple is a local farming couple, she'll set them at a table together. She'll pair them up yeah, like that. And that really brings for great conversation. <clears throat> so if you ever get to North Dakota, come visit us. We'd love to, love to have you at our lodge, and I'll give you a farm tour if you want one, and, or have coffee with you in the morning. So uh, let's get excited about covers, huh? You just got to get people out on your farm and show them what you're passionate about, and, uh, and they'll get passionate about it too. So if anybody has any questions at this point, I, what's the time? I guess I haven't been paying attention. Are we? One of the, if I have a, if I have a minute, I, I have a, I was visiting this morning, it reminded me this discussion about corn that is producing its own nitrogen through this symbi symbiotic relationship with the exudates that's dripping off its roots and bacteria that live in it, you know, that whole concept of, uh, of biology helping a plant, and a plant helping the biology. Well, uh, a soil scientist in North Dakota that I've gotten to be very good friends with, uh, Dr. Dave Franson, he's been, he's been wondering why no-till farms, long-term no-till farms, and he's proven this over the last decade, doing nitrogen rate studies in wheat, sunflowers, and corn across the state that a long-term no-tiller can get a 50-pound end credit just because he's not tilling. And he's proven it. And he was skeptical about it. But he, he set out to prove it because he was hearing no-tillers tell him, well, we don't use as much nitrogen as we used to. Well, uh, he was skeptical, so he said, I'm going to prove it. And he did. So, but now he's been on a mission to find out why. Why are they getting that end credit? I along with most other no-tillers and even most probably fertility specialists would say, well, you've increased your, your uh, active organic pool percentage in the soil. You know, you've got all this residue now after six, eight, 10 years, 30 years, whatever it is, you've got more organic matter to mineralize. So that's where the nitrogen is coming from, easy, right? Well. Dave has been suspicious is that, that that not is exactly a one-to-one -one correlation. So he did a soil test last year across the state of North Dakota on 13 or 20 sites, I don't remember. But he asked producers if he could get a soil test from their no-till field and then one across the road from their neighbor's field. So he asked me that question. And I said, yeah, that neighbor, but not that neighbor. We all have neighbors, right? So uh, he did, and he did that all, I didn't realize this, he was doing it all across the state. Well, anyway, I just last fall, I heard him give a little presentation. He sent those soil samples off to a lab that can quantify and identify biology, soil bio, specific soil biologies. I don't, don't, don't ask me how they do it, but they do it. And... Uh, the interesting thing was, and I thought it was, you know, kind of almost mind-blowing, is that every no long-term no-till sample site across the state had this bacteria that is present in native prairie. And it's a nitrogen-fixing bacteria. It's a known nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Um, that, that's not like it produces, not like it has a nodule on the root of a soybean plant. It's not because it's a, it's a legume. It's just living in the soil, probably feeding off plant root exudates, and, uh, and somehow, you know, somehow producing, pulling nitrogen out of the air in the soil and, and producing nitrogen. Uh, but the conventional soils right across the road did not have the presence of this bacteria in every case. So, it was a mind blower for me, and I, I don't know where that will go, but I'll bet somebody is lining up to study it. <laughs> there'll, be, there'll probably be money available to study that one. So, 
Uh, it's just encouraging. So every step of the way, we learn something new about, about soil health and soil biology, and, and it's been positive. I, very few negative things have come from it. All right. What's our time, Woody? What? I sure can. Um, in, in the mid-90s, when we were really getting wet, and we were looking for ways to, uh, to use more water, and Dwayne Beck, no-till no guru from South Dakota, I'm sure you guys have probably seen him in articles or heard him personally, great guy, great mind, and he just kept telling me, it isn't that you have too much water, you don't have enough plants. And I'm like, Dwayne, come on. You know, I've only got a short growing season. How am I going to get more plants in my system? So that's how the whole concept of covers came to be on my farm, was uh, an inspiration from Dwayne Beck to get more plants in my system. Uh, now, maybe he was insinuating I should have like alfalfa or perennials or, you know, I don't, you, but it doesn't matter what his intention was. His intention was right. We needed more plants. So even though I did this, I, my thought process was because I was too wet, we all know that it seems to help in dry years too, which is kind of amazing that it helps both wet and dry. Well, anyway, a group of farmers in our area that were avid no-tillers all kind of had this same, you know, we'd get together and talk once in a while in coffee shops. We decided to pool our mental resources and sit down with a group of researchers from the region, including Dwayne Beck, and start our own research farm in our area. We didn't have, within a hundred mile radius of, of my area, there's no active, uh, there was no active research going on uh, with tillage systems, no till in particular. So these, these 12 producers from six different counties uh, sat down at a table, hammered out a format for a research farm. We rented a quarter of land at an intersection of two state highways and uh, started in 1990. <clears throat> and we had, we had uh, six different crops, I believe, and like 10 or 12 different rotations, using them in short rotations, medium length rotations, and long rotations. And from the very start, cover crop was part of this system. And our first manager, who was a kind of entrenched uh, researcher, you know, so I think he just kind of had his mind made up that cover crops were probably not a good deal, found all kinds of ways that he didn't like them and one day said, ah, it's either the cover crops or me. And so we got a different manager. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then things happened. Then we, had, then we had things happen on the farm. We didn't just have annual crop rotation study. We had annual crops with cover crops, wherever we could put them in. Our goal was continuous cover crops in certain rotations that we had out there. And we didn't ever achieve that, but we, that was our goal. We got to be about 75% of our rotations had, had a cover involved with it. But one of the things that came out of it was we were having difficulty with peas. We were using peas as our legume. And we were having difficulty if the planter unit was having to plant into a pea cover crop, they're viney, and even when they're dead, they're laying on top of the ground, and this fresh pea re dead pea residue was difficult to work with. So our manager thought, well, what if I plant the peas in 30-inch rows, but offset them so that when I'll plant my, I'll plant my uh, corn in the radish row in between the pea row. So we had every 15 inches, it was peas, radish, peas, radish, peas, radish. That's how Biostriptil was born in North Dakota. Yeah, just out of necessity, you know. We just had to get the peas out of the row. <laughs> and, and, but we realized there, there were some benefits. The soil warmed up quicker. Uh, it seemed like the brassicas, the corn responded very well behind the brassica row. Um, 
I took it then, you know, once you see something like that being done in one place, then you can, you're like, okay, I got this machinery, uh, maybe I could do it a little different. And then Woody came down to the lodge one time, showed a picture of faba beans that were, had froze and were dark, and I'm like, why am I raising peas? How come I'm not raising faba beans, right? So, so I started experimenting with faba beans. And that's, uh, that's the great thing about, about uh, having these exchanges is that I can't tell you how to farm on your farm in Ontario. I, I would be doing you an injustice, but maybe there's something up here I, that I did that you're like, oh, well, maybe I could try some version of that on my farm. I think that's, that's important. All right, well, okay. Okay, so like if I'm planning right back on that Brassica row, um, it, it really hasn't. Uh, what I've noticed is like just when the frost goes out, you'll, there'll be a hole there. But if you, get, if you get a rain, you know, uh, it just starts sloughing in and di it just disappears. So it hasn't been an issue unless, unless they get huge. Like uh, you get a turn up the size of a football, uh, it looks like it, it, there's a hole there about the half the size of a football. That, so it, that's, that's why it's nice to have uh, some in-row competition to keep those, the tubers a little smaller. Uh, I do, in the past, I have been running down that row with that same implement and placing some fertilizer right ahead of, of planting. So sometimes just that operation, you know, also then creates a, a little. My goal is to not do that, though. My goal is to plant un, with a, that undisturbed row. Right here. How much has my organic matter changed? Okay, so the question is how much is over the years of, of no-till, and that's, that's a really good, I'm glad you asked that because um, how much has my organic matter changed in my farm system uh, since I've been no-tilling and then cover cropping? So when I first started no-tilling, and that was 40 years ago, so our farm, you know, the farms around me have lost another percent organic matter at least in the last 40 years. So if, if the farms around me were at 4% organic matter, now they're at 3, right? Well, I'm at 7. So there's, there's some good things happening there. Um, but what happened is I no-tilled for basically 20 years before I really started in, incorporating cover crops. And my organic matters leveled off at like 5, 5.5. And, and I think I was just mineralizing it reached an equilibrium with the amount of material that was being deposited back in the soil. Uh, the biology was there. I just reached an equilibrium. And I've heard other no-tillers, long-term no-tillers, say the same thing. So I, I don't think it's just me. But then when I threw cover crops in, then I got this another ramp up. And, and A, you're producing more biomass. That one picture I showed of the corn planter, uh, with the darker stubble and lighter stubble. Uh, the university actually does uh, clippings of my cover crops. There's, there was 5,000 pounds of biomass produced in that cover crop uh, just in two and a half months in the fall. And, and that's dry matter, dry matter biomass. So when you start adding that biomass into your system, um, I think that's you know, what gives you that opportunity. And like these, the, you, what you guys can do out here, raising six foot high rye and rolling it down and planting into it, you can see even more. I mean, you're, you're getting probably 10,000 pounds, seven to 10,000 pounds of biomass that is high carbon besides, so it takes a little while for that to break down. Um, it's, it's, good, it's good stuff. So yes, to answer your question, it's been, it's been an improvement in my organic matter by incorporating cover crops.
Okay, I'll, I'll answer your last question first about why do, why do I only apply the compost once every four years? Is that what you said? Well, I tell you, primarily it's because it's pretty labor intensive to spread four or 500 acres in a year. I mean, that's when you go out with a load of compost and spread two and a half acres and then go back to the farm and fill up and, you know, it, so I wouldn't want to have to try to spread my whole farm in a year. Um, that, so that's kind of the answer to that question. Not that it wouldn't be fine, but uh, the, the compost also stabilizes the, the fertility in that, uh, in that mix. Well, I shouldn't say. It stabilizes the nitrogen. The phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, all those minerals are quite readily available. Um, but it fits in that range. I'm not really over applying it that one year and then being able to use it over the next four. Uh, and what was your first question again? Do you have a specific cover crop mix for your year? Oh, yeah. Um, no. <laughs> Is it, uh, what I, I have designed my cover crop mix with the criteria that I want something that's fast growing and frost tolerant. So my cover crop mix that I put in my cereal stubbles ha have to fit that criteria and, and, and this is really important, they have to be conducive to what I'm planting next year, right? So there, there's a lot in the sequencing thing or your rotation. A cover crop is a rotation. So you don't want to, if you're, let's just say for example, you're a canola grower. You probably don't want to add a lot of brassicas to your rotation, right? Uh, you might want to think about other, other crops. Um, if you're a sugar beet grower, you want to, might, might want to be really careful, you know, what you're putting in there. Uh, or, or tomatoes, or, so, you know, you, you got to think about what you're planting. Now, I'm putting that sequence, I'm following it with corn, I'm putting in plants that corn seem to like to follow. Uh, plus the cold tolerance and whatever. Now, with that said, there are plants from a grazing mix. There are no one really good forage plants. Brassicas are great forages. Uh, legumes are great forages as long as you don't have bloat issues. And peas and faba beans have no problem with that. Uh, flax is kind of a non-issue when it comes from a grazing standpoint. But one reason I really like flax is it does not have to get very mature and it has a stiff stubble. So after all the other green materials have, have succumbed to winter and just kind of basically broke down, the flax is standing. Like right now, we have about two feet of snow on the level, and uh, the only thing you can see sticking out of those cover crop fields is a little bit of flax sticking up the top. So. Good. Thanks, Joe. We have a few questions that came up here through the directors, uh, and I wanted to take a few of them. So first question is, uh, do you test areas or do you just go big or go home? Like, do you go all in or how do you approach it when you're testing new things? Yeah, I, it, it, it depends on how new it is to me. You know, like if I can come here and I can talk to somebody that's doing something and really relate to it and go, light bulb, that'll work on my farm, I'll go all in, right? But if it's something that I'm really, I really don't know about, I'll, I'll do a little few strip trials. So that's kind of the answer to that question. Okay, another one we have here, and, and you mentioned that you had worked with some equipment manufacturers and doing some things. So when you're working with those equipment manufacturers and looking at modifications, th th does it get to a point that they want to get into commercialization of that product? And if so, is there compensation for patents or how does that all work out if you get into that situation? I, I have been down that road about compensation for patents and things like that. But in the cases that, that I've been in, when they've given me something up front, you know, like in the case of DMI, when they said, when they said, we'll give you this toolbar, it's yours. But if you come up with something, it's ours. You know, so it was up front, right? If I wanted to go down that road and, and be a manufacturer and come up with ideas and patent them, I could have done that. 
because I certainly had some things that were patentable through the years. But that really wasn't my passion. It just wasn't my passion, right? So I didn't pursue that angle, but I uh, probably could have. Okay, another question here, and I think it's just trying to get a, a general frame of reference. How deep is your topsoil? Okay, native prairie in our area, which is very little left, but there are some examples of it. Probably in a lake bed, you know, in a, in a low area, high clay sediment area, this topsoil is worth three to five feet. Uh, most of those are six inches to a foot. The loamy areas uh, with some slope, uh, we're probably 18 inches to two feet in the native prairie, and now they're, you know, zero to six inches. So on my farm, and I, and I really question this. That's a, that's a great question. I, I, I should address this. I, when I read articles, I've had cover crop for four years in my system, and I've, in, I've got six inches of new topsoil. Bullshit. I'm sorry, but you don't get six inches of topsoil in four years of cover crops. Um, you can improve the quality of that soil a lot in four years, but you don't gain four inches of, or six inches of topsoil. So uh, what you do see is you can see you start to darken. You know, you start to put carbon in the soil. Carbon, carbon goes into the soil at an extremely slow rate. So. Even like on my farm, if you separated out the, the stable carbon portion from the active uh, organic matter portion, it all contributes to the total organic matter percentage, right? But that, that total carbon, stable carbon, is slow to gain and it's slow to release. Most of that stable carbon has been lost to erosion because uh, sometimes it takes hundreds of years for that stable carbon to release. That's, that's the beautiful part about it. But that active carbon portion, then, you know, if you, with rainfall, temperature, and biology, you can convert that quite quickly. Okay. Uh, and, and last question, and I think if, if I look what you've done, and you, you had a picture of your father early on here, showing, you know, kind of the succession towards you. You spent a lifetime on a journey here. So what's the succession plan, and, and how you, have you started implementing that? Well, I'm probably, I'm probably not very, I wouldn't be one to get, get up here and talk about succession planning, probably. Um, but I, I, I mean, my, my daughter, who's raising a family, lives in the local area, manages the lodge, her and her husband, uh, they, don't, they both have day jobs. But they, they, they come and farm seasonally with me. They have some of their own land. They're looking to rent more this year. So, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to get into agriculture. Uh, they use dad's machinery. That's great, right? But yet, they're picking up pieces as they can afford it uh, that, that I get to use. So I guess that's kind of my succession plan is uh, we don't have a... They, they didn't all of a sudden quit their job in the city, come home and say, okay, I'm here, how do I earn money? They have their own, they have their own money and they're just working their way in. So that's, that's how we're doing it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, please join me in giving a round, uh, Joe, for a great presentation. Awesome job. Thank you very much. Thank you. You'll get a chance in a breakout session if you have